New Testament Greek Sentence Diagramming. This is part five in our how-to series. As always, we'll begin with a little review. A sentence diagram is a grammatical map of the sentence. Its key components are baselines and shelves and branches, stilts, or standards. In this video, we'll give some attention to branches for the first time. To be a competent diagrammer, you have to be a competent grammarian. And so here are the building blocks of grammar. You have kernels, which are the core of their clause. They consist of, minimally, a verb with its subject, also a complement if one is present. And the subject and the complement, remember, answer those who or what questions with respect to the verb. Ask who or what before the verb to find the subject. Ask who or what after the verb to find the complement. A modifier is a word or phrase that supplies more information about another word or phrase. And a series is a set of parallel items. Let's circle the series, since we'll be working with that one in this video. Here's a sentence diagram that we practiced with. It was a little tougher than some of the others. God has sent his only begotten son into the world. The verb is apestalken, has sent. Who or what has sent? God has sent. So hathaos is the subject. God has sent who or what? He sent his son. So tan huyan is the object. Then autu modifies huyan. Monogane also modifies huyan. And the prepositional phrase aston kosmon tells us where God sent his only begotten son. We learned some new symbols in part four of our video series. We learned the indirect object symbol and the appositive symbol. Also the introductory conjunction and the interjection or direct address symbol. We also learned that elliptical elements are shown with a capital X in parentheses or alternately with a Greek or English word in parentheses. Now here in part five, let's add some new functions and their symbols. First, the series function. Here's an example from Matthew 2, verses 14 and 15. Let me translate it fairly literally. And he, having arisen, took along the child and his mother by night, and he departed into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod. In diagram form, the sentence would look like this. Let's first notice this short series consisting of two objects, the child and his mother. These two nouns form a series of direct objects completing the verb paraleben. So after paraleben comes the vertical line separating the verb from its object, and then the object slot divides into two branches of a series, the child on top, the coordinating conjunction and in the middle, and then his mother on the bottom branch. This is the standard way of diagramming series of anything. No matter what the grammatical element and no matter how many items in the series, we can work with this branch symbol. But this is not the only coordinate series in this sentence. Notice that there are three main verbs, all connected into a three-item series, with two occurrences of the conjunction chi, tying them into a single series. So the subject is that pronominal article ha, followed by the subject predicate divider, and then the verb slot divides into this three-part series that you see. So this is the standard way of showing series in sentence diagramming. Any sentence element whatsoever and any number of items in a series can be shown by means of these branches. All right, let's take another one. From then, Jesus began to be preaching and saying, repent, from Matthew 4, 17. Here, we have two infinitives, and you notice that the grammatical construction requires the series to be closed on both ends. So we have a stub on the left end that indicates the infinitives as a series completing the verb erxota, Jesus began who or what, he began to be preaching and saying. But then those two infinitives have the same object. He began to be preaching, repent. He began to be saying, repent. Uh, that quotation, repent, answers the who or what question with respect to both of those infinitives, and so it's the object of both. And so we have to bring that series back together again to a right pointing stub where once again we have a unity, we have that series expressed as a grammatical unity attached to which we can diagram this quotation as the object. Most of the time your series branches will be able to be open on one end with a stub on the other, but once in a while you'll need branches closed on both ends with stubs on both ends. Now let's talk about the predicate nominative. This is a sentence function where the nominative case is used to complete a linking verb 
and rename or describe the subject. And because of its connection back to the subject, it's in the nominative case. So here's an example. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. Here's how this would be diagrammed. The verb is este. Who or what is something? You are something. Okay, you are who or what? You are the light of the world. So tafos is the complement of the verb. But it's not a direct object because este is not a transitive verb that has the kind of action that can transfer onto objects. Phos should not be parsed in the accusative case in this context. It should be parsed in the nominative case, and it's diagrammed as a predicate nominative. You notice how this line, instead of standing vertically, slants upward to the left. The idea is that it sort of points this word back to the subject. The predicate nominative points back to the subject and renames or describes the subject. And that's the logic behind this slanted line. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Notice there's no linking verb expressed at all here. That verb is elliptical. And by instinct, we are inclined to take makarios as the subject because it's the first word in the sentence. But let's look at it closely. Makarioi is an adjective, not a noun, and it lacks the article, whereas hoi ptokoi, tokos is also an adjective, but ptokoi with the article is functioning as a substantive, the poor ones, the poor people. And so here we have a noun function, and this adjective makarioi is constructed in the predicate position in relation to that noun. And so tokoi is the subject, and makarioi is the predicate nominative. In diagram form, it looks like this. The poor in spirit, here's the understood verb, are blessed. So makarioi is predicate nominative. Some people like to go by part of speech rather than case and would call tafos predicate noun in the first example. They would call makarioi in this example predicate adjective rather than predicate nominative. To me, the terminology is a matter of indifference. I'll call them predicate nominatives for the purposes of this video. Now, we have some other considerations to take up in this video. First, related to what we've just talked about with the predicate nominative comes the question, how do we determine when there are two nominatives, which is the subject and which is the predicate nominative? We had a little struggle with that, perhaps, already with the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. So let's dig a little deeper into that question. Here's what Daniel Wallace in his grammar, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, has to say. He says you distinguish subject from predicate by the fact that the subject presents the known information, something that has already been discussed in the context. The predicate is the clause's new information about the subject. It may be in the form of a question about the subject. It may be in the form of an assertion about the subject. But the predicate provides the clause's new information. I have a little different approach to the matter. I like to summarize it this way. The subject expresses the clause's topic and the predicate expresses the clause's assertion or question about the topic. And I really should have put assertion or question in bold face here, shouldn't I? So let's at least highlight those. The subject expresses the clause's topic. It's what the sentence says something about. The predicate expresses what the sentence says or asks about its topic. The clause's assertion or question about the subject. These two different approaches will usually yield the same result. But sometimes one approach will yield a clearer result than the other. So it's worth taking both approaches in a difficult instance where you're having a great deal of difficulty figuring out which nominative is subject and which is predicate. Try both of these and see whether one of them provides some clarity. Once in a while, you'll have an extremely difficult time deciding and you'll basically come down to flipping a coin. But most of the time, you can resolve the question with one of these approaches or the other. Now, there is some what I call mechanical guidance. The guidance that Wallace and I offered as the umbrella sort of consideration is more in the logical area rather than more mechanical. But there are some grammatical mechanics that enter into the picture that can help us out in many cases, not all, but certainly uh, the majority of cases. An adjective, when it's constructed in the predicate position, is going to be the predicate nominative. The predicate position involves a noun or a substantive of some sort that that predicate that that predicate adjective modifies. But when that predicate adjective is in the predicate position, you can count on it. That's going to be the predicate nominative. If you have difficulty remembering what the predicate position is, we can express it this way. The predicate position is the construction in which the noun modified by the adjective is articular, usually. 
And the adjective is anarthrous, always. I didn't put the word always, but the predicate adjective always lacks the article. The noun it modifies usually has it. When both nominatives are substantives, and by substantive I mean a noun or some other grammatical construction functioning as a noun, a substantive adjective, a substantive participle, some other kind of phrase. When both nominatives are substantives and only one of them is articular, the articular one is usually the subject. If one of the two nominatives is a pronoun, the pronoun is usually the subject. Now there is an exception to that. The interrogative pronoun is usually the word that asks an interrogative clause's question. And because it's the word that asks the question, that makes it the predicate in most instances. Wallace also teaches that a proper noun is usually the subject but as I looked through quite a number of examples of this, I really was not able to confirm that claim. It appeared to me that the proper noun was quite often the predicate. So I'm providing coverage of Wallace's point here, but I'm also questioning its validity. I don't believe you'll find that particular point of guidance to be reliable. All right, let's take some examples now. We've already looked at this one, blessed are the poor in spirit. You have hoi tokoi, articular, makarioi, and arthris, this is the predicate position of the adjective, and therefore makarioi is predicate adjective, leaving the articular expression hoip tokoi to be the subject. And so we would diagram like this. Notice the elliptical verb. Matthew 3, 4 says, in reference to John the Baptist, his food was locusts and wild honey. Probably some unfamiliar vocabulary there, but the construction is really quite clear. You notice a nominative case noun with an article, you notice a linking verb, ain, and you should recognize this ending as a nominative case ending in the third declension. Now this one is really unusual. It looks dative, uh, but this is the dictionary form of that word, so it's nominative, and uh, agrion is an adjective modifying meli. Here's what it looks like in diagram form. His food, subject, was, verb, and then a series of predicate nominatives now, so we get to use the series symbol, locusts and honey, and agrion is diagrammed as modifying only meli. It's wild honey. He's not talking about wild locusts and wild honey. All locusts are wild. I suppose somebody somewhere might have domesticated a locust, but it's a little hard to imagine. So agrion modifies only meli. We have here three nouns in the nominative case. The one with the article is the subject. The series of two predicates, you notice, lack the article. You are the light of the world. Another example that we've already looked at. What's the operative term here? For mechanical guidance, what you have is the pronoun who mace is the subject. Here's the linking verb. And then we have a noun to be the predicate. Let's think back to our logical guidance. The subject is the word that presents the clause's topic. So Jesus is saying something about you people. The predicate is the word that presents the clause's statement about the topic, the light of the world. So Jesus is not saying, let me tell you something about the light of the world. The light of the world is you. That's not the way it works. He's talking about his disciples, the people. They're the known information. They're referred to in the pronoun you. The new information about those people is that they are the light of the world. So whether you take Wallace's approach, the new information is the light of the world, whether you take my approach, the light of the world is the statement that the sentence is making about the subject, either way you can come to the same conclusion that humes is the subject and tafos is the predicate. And the mechanical guidance that the pronoun is usually the subject lines up with the logical guidance. Matthew 3.17, this is my son, the beloved, we have three nominatives here again. Hutas is nominative, huias is nominative, agape tas is nominative, but this is not a series like locusts and wild honey were. Instead, the diagram looks like this. A simple kernel, this is my son. And then ha agape tas is in one of the common attributive positions. Article noun, article adjective is a very common attributive adjective position. So agape tas is simply an adjective modifying huias. This is John the Baptist as he is baptizing Jesus. Hutas refers to the known information. Jesus is on the scene being baptized. Or, looked at the way I like to say it, Hutas is the person who's functioning as the topic of this statement. The new information, the statement made about the topic, is my son, my beloved son. 
And of course, this is the voice from heaven where God the Father is speaking, identifying who this is that John is baptizing. So this is a very clear instance where, again, the pronoun stands as the subject and the noun is the predicate, providing the clause's new information, the clause's assertion about its subject. Matthew 12, 48, who is my mother and who are my brothers? This is a case where people had informed Jesus that his mother and his brothers were outside wishing to speak to him. And so he asks the question, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Here's how this looks in diagram form. You might be inclined to put Tis as the subject because it comes first, but that's really not the way it works. The known information is mother and brothers. Those are the nouns that the people speaking to Jesus have just used. And so Jesus wants to say something about his mother and his brothers. Actually, he's asking rather than saying. So he's not putting Tis, who, question mark, on the table as the subject to be discussed. And then the answer to that is my mother. He's putting mother and brothers on the table as the topic to be discussed. And he's raising the question, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? So Tis and Tinnes, the interrogative pronouns, as indicated earlier in the presentation, the interrogative pronoun is usually the predicate because these are the words that are asking the clauses questions in relation to the subject. All right, one more topic for this video, passive voice verbs. When a verb is truly passive voice, I've put the word truly there because many verbs in Greek that are parsed as passive in form are not truly passive in meaning and we can't get into that issue in this video. But when you've determined that a verb is truly passive in voice, the subject is acted upon. Actually, you have to figure that out in order to figure out that the verb is truly passive. Is the subject being acted upon? If so, then that verb is passive voice. Normally, you know, the subject performs the action of the verb. But when the verb is passive voice, the subject has the verb's action performed on itself. So the subject is acted upon. And the verb has to be phrased in the passive before your who or what question in search of the subject will work correctly. We'll see this in a moment when we look at the examples. And passive verbs generally have no complement at all. Generally, that's an important word. In later videos, we'll see that sometimes there is a complement, but most of the time, there's no complement at all for a passive voice verb. Okay, so some examples here. Herod was troubled, Matthew 2, 3. It might be arguable whether this is truly passive or not. Was Herod being acted upon by someone? Well, the information that Herod received was troubling him. So in a sense, he was being acted upon. Herod was troubled. Now, tarasso, the main verb, means to trouble. If you just phrase it that way, somebody troubles, and you ask who or what troubles, you're not going to find Herod as the subject because Herod isn't troubling anybody in this verse. Herod troubled plenty of people throughout his lifetime, but in this verse, he's not troubling anyone. So we have to phrase that verb in the passive voice is troubled, was troubled. Okay, who or what was troubled? Herod was troubled. Okay, now it works. So when the verb is truly passive, you're gonna to have to phrase it that way before your who or what question will work to identify the subject. And then typically you don't even ask who or what after the verb. Herod was troubled who or what? The question doesn't even make sense because passive verbs generally do not have a complement. So the only who or what question we'll ask will be the subject question. Here's how we would diagram that, nothing special. The verb is in its proper slot. The subject is in its proper slot. There is no complement at all. Another example, a voice was heard in Ramah. This is from the end of Matthew 2, when Herod had killed all the boy babies two years old and under in the vicinity of Bethlehem. A voice was heard in Ramah, was heard. Who or what was heard? The nominative case noun to provide the subject is phone. And it would be diagrammed like this. Okay, one more, Matthew 3.16, and behold, ena okthesan. You might look at that and say, I see theta eta sigma, that must be future passive. Well, there is theta eta sigma, but that sigma belongs to the ending, san, and we just have the theta eta for the aorist passive, and on the front end of that verb is the augment, alpha has been lengthened to eta. So this is from anoigo, and behold, the heavens were opened. Who or what was opened? The heavens were open. And the introductory conjunction chi and the interjection edu would be diagrammed like this for a further point of review from our part four video. We're finished with part five. Happy diagramming.